But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or grow it. It, scram it sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Would you all bow with me in prayer? Gracious God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We have felt you already through the music and song and through the reading of your word, and we pray now that you would again speak to us the truth from your word, that we might be able to take it to heart and live it out faithfully in a world that really desperately needs to know you. So, Lord, we pray that you would make it effective in our lives and that we would be responsive and obedient and loving to you and to all who are made in your image. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The doorbell rang and a lady came to uh, the front door to uh, find that there was a man waiting there and she didn't recognize him. She said, can I help you? And he looked very, very forlorn and he said, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I'm collecting for money for an unfortunate family in the neighborhood. Uh, the husband has lost his job and the kids are hungry. The utilities uh, will be turned off soon. And worst of all, he's, they're going to be kicked out of their apartment if they don't pay their rent by today. And she said, well, of course, I'd be happy to help, um, but who, who are you? And he said, well, I'm the landlord. People's motives can be hard to discern sometimes. And where John picked up in the story of Jonah, we have Jonah uh, quite upset. Um, he, uh, he's upset because of the response that those in Nineveh had to his message. Uh, just a recap of this little story of four chapters. You remember, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, I want you to go to Nineveh to tell them that I'm going to bring judgment upon them. And instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah went the other way. He went to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa. He got on a boat, and he took off toward Tarshish. And God sent a great storm uh, that put the ship almost to the point of wrecking. And the, all the men on the ship, they threw things overboard. They cast lots to determine who was responsible. And they came to Jonah and said, it's you, it's you. Tell us who you are and what, what the problem is. And he identified himself as a Hebrew, a prophet of God, uh, the one who uh, believed and followed the God who created everything, the sea, the land, everything. And they said, well, what do we do? And he said, 
throw me overboard and then the, the sea will calm. And that's exactly what happened. And God sent a big fish to swallow him up. And Jonah in the, in the belly of that fish uh, prayed uh, basically a final prayer. And God in his mercy uh, s- had the fish spit him out on dry land. And Jonah had promised he would do what God wanted him to do. So he went to Nineveh and he preached that judgment was coming. And this was the sermon. And you're never going to get a sermon this short here. But this was the sermon. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. That was it. And the people repented, and they, the king called a fast, and they said, maybe, maybe God will turn away his wrath upon us. And God was responsive to their plea for his mercy. And Jonah wasn't happy. Uh, we're, we're taking lessons from this prophet, this disobedient prophet, and we're just going to make some simple observations from this fourth and final chapter of the book of Jonah. And the first thing that I want us to note is that God can use anyone. God can use anyone. Do you believe that? I think we, we generally say, yeah, I believe God can use anyone, but we have a tendency to disqualify ourselves sometimes. Oh, send someone else. They know more. Uh, send someone else. They're better at praying. Send someone else. They're... But God calls people to do things, and guess what? God will equip the people who he calls. Um, I have a plaque that was given to me as a gift, and I, ha- I have it hung up in my office now. And it, I, I've heard it before, but I, I, I treasure this little plaque now that simply says, God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. He doesn't look at our credentials and determine, okay, this person's got all the stuff that I need. Rather, he looks at the heart and he says, I want you to serve me. And when he sees that heart, he brings out and he supplies all that's needed to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. He's looking more for readiness to serve. And, you know, sometimes he'll take us even reluctantly. He did with Jonah. He did with Moses. Remember Moses? God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh and Moses says, uh, I don't talk so good. And God says, I'll send Aaron. And I made your tongue. I know who you are. And you read the rest of Exodus, and Aaron hardly speaks a peep. Moses is talking all the time. Why? Because God gave him the power to do what he needed to do. Um, God will use anyone. And here's the key. God will use you whether you're obeying or not. You'll either be a good example or you'll be a bad example, but he can still use you. And that's what he did in the case of Jonah. Uh, God used Jonah when he was running away. When he was running away and the sailors asked, what do we do? Throw me overboard. They threw threw him overboard, and you read in the first chapter in the 16th verse that suddenly these men who were praying to all different kinds of gods who really didn't know what in the world was going on, suddenly they're praying to the God of Jonah. They're praying to the creator of the universe. They're making sacrifices to him and vowing their life to him. It's kind of reverse evangelism. I I mean, really, Jonah is, is a horrible example here, and yet they see the power of God and the evidence of God, and they turn to God. Um, God used Jonah even when his heart uh, wasn't in the message. Uh, that's why we read in the second verse here in chapter 4, uh, he, he's mad at God. He says, I, that's, that's why I ran in the first place. I knew you were merciful. I knew you were compassionate. I knew you were slow to anger. And the truth of the matter was, he did not want 
the people of Nineveh to repent. He did not want them to be recipients of God's mercy. Assyria was an oppressive nation that, that, that had a tendency to conquer Israel, and he didn't want to have anything to do with them getting God's mercy or grace. His heart was not in it at all. Um, and yet, God still used him. You, you look at his message, and he didn't even tell them what they could do. He said, in 40 days, the city will be overturned. He didn't say, but if you repent, God may change his mind. He didn't say that. He just said, doomsday's coming. And I imagine he said it with a smile on his face because that's what he wanted for them. But God got a hold of their hearts, and they did repent, and God in turn relented, and God determined he would save them. In the video at the beginning uh, where it told us all these reasons to give thanks to God, there was a phrase in there that I caught that I thought was really good because we should thank him that he makes our messes into his message. He can take the brokenness and messed upness of our life and still turn something beautiful into it. Is that not a part of the good news of the gospel? That he'll take the brokenness of sinful people and he can redeem us and transform us and change us and bring about something good. Second observation that I want us to make from this uh, uh, fourth chapter of Jonah is you can agree with God and still be disobedient. I have met some uh, people in my life who theologically they had everything down. They had all their I's dotted and all their T's crossed. They, they knew their Bible inside and out but they could be vicious and difficult and hard-hearted. They, they agreed doctrinally with right things, but their heart was another matter. Jonah, he agrees with a lot of things that are very true about God. And we'll just run through them real quick. Jonah and God agree that Nineveh is wicked. They're both in agreement that Nineveh's in trouble. Um, Jonah and God both agree that God is the creator of all. He identifies himself as a follower, the one who created everything. Jonah and God agree that God can miraculously save people, and Jonah is one of those who God miraculously saved. When's the last time you wrote in the belly of a fish? You know, but God did a miracle, didn't he? Uh, to save him and to make him compliant. Jonah and God agree that God is gracious and merciful. Jonah already knew that about the character and the nature of God. And yet he was working against it at the same time. It was okay as long as God was gracious and merciful to him and his people. He just didn't want him to be gracious and merciful to those people over there. And Jonah and God also agree that God warns so people can repent. And I'm just going to bring it to the contemporary right now for a moment. You pretty much hear on a regular basis that we are all sinners, that we have all broken God's law, that we stand before Almighty God guilty. There are churches that you would never hear the word sin in. There are churches that would just talk about being good and everybody is good. And that is no service to anyone. The truth of the matter is we all need to be warned because there is a holy God that we will all stand before one day. 
He is holy and righteous and just, and the Bible is really clear. He must, he must punish sin. And the wonderful good news of the gospel is he did punish sin. 2,000 years ago, God poured his wrath out upon his own son, And everything that you and I deserve for our wrongdoing, Jesus took upon himself. And if we trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the wrath of God will not be poured upon us. If I didn't tell you that, if we as a church did not tell people that, we would fail to warn them. And see, the very warning is a sign of God's mercy and his goodness and his grace because he wants people to turn to him. So Jonah and God agree on all those things, and yet Jonah still remained disobedient third observation we're going to make and this is about God and God gives four reasons for his compassion now I find this interesting because um, in the book of Job Job asked a lot of questions and God finally kind of uh, answers Job by saying were you there when I created this do you understand how much rain or snow are in the clouds basically God says to Job you're not going to get the answers to the questions that you want. I, I, I'm God and you're not. And, 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 and from my vantage point, I kind of think, and, and I kind of laugh sometimes when people will tell me, well, when I see God, I'm going to ask him, and they'll list these things that they want to know. And I, and I kind of chuckle inwardly because I think, he's God, we're not. He really doesn't owe us any answers, does he? He doesn't owe us any answers, and yet he gives some reasons to Jonah, this disobedient prophet, I think because he's wanting to change Jonah's heart, and he gives some reasons why he has compassion on the people of Nineveh. And they're found in verses 10 and 11, and I'm going to read them again. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern over the great city of Nineveh, in which there were more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right from their left, and also many animals? Four things. Basically, God provides this vine as an object lesson. It's basically a children's story, a children's sermon that God gives to Jonah to teach him some things. And the first one is, there is a worm that destroys. There is a worm that destroys. I would call it the worm factor. You know, there's... And remember, it's not about the vine. God is trying to answer Jonah and why he's so angry that God would be merciful to the Ninevites. Who's the worm in Nineveh? Same worm in Mattoon. Same worm all the way around the world. Jesus identifies him as a thief who comes and his whole reason that he makes around the world is to kill to destroy, to rob. It's Satan. He's the worm. He's the worm. And God says, I have compassion on these people because they're affected by the worm. They're being killed. They're being destroyed by this hater of people's souls. And God has compassion upon them as he still has compassion upon people today who are impacted by Satan himself. And let's be honest, we all fall in that category. All of us have been impacted by Satan and his work in this world. 
Second thing that God uh, gives a reason for his uh, compassion is God has labored over the city. He says to Jonah, he said, you didn't plant that vine. You didn't tend that vine. You didn't garden it. You didn't take care of it. You didn't give it fertilizer. You didn't water it. You labored over that vine none whatsoever. You just enjoyed the benefit of the vine. What's the point? God is saying, I labored over those people. The reality of, of, of life is whether people know God personally or not, God has invested himself in every single person. There isn't a person on this planet that exists that God did not preordain and determine that he wanted them here. And that he loves them infinitely. And he provides for our needs. And he tends to us daily. The scripture describes God's loving care for us in this way. It says he records every single one of our days in his book. You know those baby books where you write everything down? You know, the first, the, 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 the first word, the first tooth, the first this, the first that? I'll just confess, this is your pastor and his, his wife. Both of our children's books are incomplete. Life just happened and we'd forget to write things down. But our God doesn't forget to write anything down. He labors over you and me. He cares that much about us. And he cares about even those people over there that Jonah didn't care a squat about. He cares. He labors over them. Third thing that, that God gives the reason for is that he has invested time in the city. He's invested time in the people. You know what time is another word for? Love. It really is. Time is another word for love. Those you love, you give time to, do you not? When Melinda and I were dating, I think we drove her mom crazy because I was in seminary, and, 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 and her mom would comment, how can you stay on the phone so long with him? But we couldn't seem to go a day without talking. We, we worked things out so that we were always going to talk. And we've been that way ever since. When I've gone on trips, we always talk. We are always going to communicate sometime during the day. When you love somebody, you give them time. And God says, I put time into these people, Jonah. And he's put time into every single one of you and me and everybody around this planet. That's a part of why he has compassion on all of us. And the final, fourth and final reason that God uh, says he has compassion on them is that the people are confused. They're confused. He describes them this way. He says they don't know their left hand from their right hand. What does that mean? Does it literally mean that they, uh, let's see, you, you remember, uh, well, maybe some of you never had this problem, but uh, when, you, when you're learning how to drive and you're a little bit nervous and someone says, okay, turn to the left, or, or, or put your turn signal on, you're going to turn to the left, and you turn the right signal on, no, the other left. You know, but, but God's not talking about they're directionally challenged. He's talking about them morally. He's saying they don't have a clue morally what's right and what's wrong. In other words, they're lost. And you know what? God loves lost people. He sent his son for lost people. Jesus said his mission was was to rescue lost people. He said, I've come for the lost. God has compassion on them because they don't know any better. And I told you at the beginning, and I'll tell you now at the end, that this book is very unique because 
the book of Jonah is completely driven by God's word. It started with, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And then we read later, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And we end the book with the word of the Lord. Because it ends with, God asks, but he asks you, not Jonah. He asks, should I not have compassion on this great city? Or should I not have compassion for, and you fill in the blank, whether it be a family member, a neighbor, a community, a situation, should I not have compassion? And the question implied is very clear. Yes, I do have compassion. And just like Jonah, if I have compassion on those people that I've put on your heart, what is your responsibility? What are you supposed to do in partnering with me to show the compassion of God to this world? That is the point. That is what we need to grab a hold of. And I believe, I believe that if we take seriously God's message for us, we'll just go faithfully live out what he tells us to do and to be. I'm sure I'm going to butcher the name of this little village because it's a, a village in France, but La Chambord sur Lyon in uh, France um, was a small community in a, a, in a, mountain, uh, a mountain area, and they became known uh, only because they did something extraordinary that the other communities in France did not do. They protected the Jews when the Nazis invaded France. They took them in. And after the war, uh, a journalist wanted to figure out what made these people heroes, that they would risk their lives and save the Jews that came to that town. And he was kind of shocked and surprised because what he found out was they were not highly educated people. They were not particularly what you would call heroic, courageous people. But these people were simple people who went to a church, who heard on a regular basis that Jesus loves them and loves the world, and they took that to heart, and they just lived it out. And when the Nazis came in, they didn't do anything different. They just did what they had been doing, and they showed the love of God, and they protected them. What is God calling you and me to do to show the compassion and love of God? I'm going to close with a little video. This video actually is, um, it was made in Thailand. It's a commercial. It's a commercial about life insurance, ironically enough. But it has a powerful little message about the little things that we do every day that can make a difference. And it's entitled, you can be a hero too.
ขาจะไม่ได้อะไรเลยไม่ได้รวยขึ้นไม่ได้ออกทีวีไม่มีใครรู้จักไม่ได้มีชื่อเสียงที่มากขึ้นเพราะสิ่งที่เขาได้คือได้แค่ความรู้สึกได้เห็นความสุขได้เข้าใจได้ความรักในสิ่งที่เงินซื้อไม่ได้ได้โลกที่สวยงามกว่าเดิมในชีวิตคุณอะไรคือสิ่งที่คุณต้องการมากที่สุดOn behalf of Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to be a hero. Just every day, do something in His name. He said something as simple as a cup of cold water given in my name. Jesus is saying, it doesn't have to be big people. You don't have to go to Assyria. You can just go outside the doors of this building. And make a difference. I may regret this when I say, see Jonah one day in heaven, but I'm going to ask you to be better than Jonah. I'm going to ask you to invest your whole heart, not reluctantly say, "Okay, God, I'll do it," because I know if I don't, you're going to get me. I'm asking you to say, "Yes, God. I have been a recipient of your compassion, your mercy, your grace, your goodness, and by the power of your Spirit, I'm going to pass it on. I'm not going to hold back. I want to be sold out." Because you didn't hold back for me. Pray with me, would you? Lord God, we have a million reasons to be thankful, but at the very top of the list. Is your mercy and compassion that you showed by sending your Son Jesus to take our sins and to provide salvation, forgiveness, and everlasting life? And God, please move us, motivate us. To lovingly share and make him known by words and deeds, by love and time and care and concern. God, I know that when you ask that question, should I not be concerned? The answer clearly is yes, you should be. And we thank you that you are. And Lord, we know that there are people that you place in our lives, in our paths, that we 
need to show your love and compassion. You've left us here on earth to be your representatives, to demonstrate who you are to people who don't know the right from the wrong, the left from the right. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to seriously take the challenge from your word and to be your people and to show your love. There's a holiday coming up this week and a holiday coming up next month. And there, there, it's times in which family and friends get together. And not everybody that we're going to encounter is going to know you. And some of them may be blood relatives. And how we conduct ourselves and how we interact with them is going to tell them something about you or is going to tell them the wrong things about you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to take seriously our role and responsibility in letting the world know that you are a God of compassion by being compassionate people. So, Lord, I pray that you would send us forth with an extra measure of compassion and concern for our community, for our families, for our friends, our co-workers, our fellow students. And may the love of Jesus be felt and known because we're making you known. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is, <clears throat> We Are an Offering. And as we stand and sing this uh, beautiful reminder that we need to offer ourselves up to the Lord, um, I invite you. Uh, maybe God's tugging at your heart to step out in faith and trust him. Maybe he's calling you to say, um, I'm, I, I need to rededicate my life to him and to his service. Maybe he's calling you to be a part of this church family. You know I don't know what he may be saying to you. But if he's calling you in any way to respond publicly, I'm here for you. There are people that are willing to pray with you. So let's uh, respond in accordance with God speaking to us. Let's stand and sing together. We are an offering.